You guys are the remnant that survived the time change and you came to church this morning. You also are the remnant that came here. If you read ahead in Joshua chapter 5, how many of you read ahead in Joshua chapter 5 and you still came? That's good. Joshua chapter 5 starts out with this uh, circumcision. (laughs) And so here we are this morning and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Before I do though, before we get into God's word, um, a couple of things uh, this coming Saturday is the Hearts Being Healed ministry, and I would encourage you, I'm not going to go on and on like I did last week, I would encourage you if you're a guy to come and help us serve and be a part of that amazing ministry, and if you're a woman, uh, please consider coming, signing up, I think it's $25 for the whole day, which includes lunch that we prepare and serve, and uh, it, it is a very, very viable ministry, this is the 20th year of it. Uh, They're celebrating 20th year, and we've been a part of it for about 17 years, and I couldn't tell you uh, uh, how important it is to come if you can, if you can come, to come. You can sign up. Uh, It's free for men. You can sign up online or um, at the connection counter, and for women, you can sign up online, and they'll give you more information at the connection counter. Also, tonight is uh, movie night. Is uh, How many of you are planning on coming back tonight at 6 o'clock to watch this movie? It's called The Ragamuffin. It's basically a a movie about the gospel and God's grace uh, found inside of the life of Rich Mullins, uh, an amazing musician and songwriter. So hopefully you'll come back for that, and uh, there'll be some treats and intermission. There'll be a little discussion afterwards, Um, so hopefully you can come back for that. All right? Are you awake? (laughs) <laughs> There's going to be a lot of scripture this morning, okay, pointing us to a conclusion, and that conclusion is going to be during communion, Lord willing. Um, there's a scripture I'd like to uh, use this morning as a lens or as a filter all the way through uh, Joshua chapter 5, and it's found in uh, um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. If you look at the polar opposite of that, right, seek first yourself and your own kingdom, and your unrighteousness will be added unto you. (laughs) Pretty true, right? And what happened to the uh, Israelites as they fled Egypt, and after uh, the first year, they were in Kadesh Barnea, and they, they paused there in unbelief. They did not believe the promise of God, that God was going to go ahead of them into the promised land that he had already promised, and fight their battles for them and give them this land. And as we know, this, we always have to keep this as a backdrop as we go through the book of Joshua. These were God's promises that they failed to obey or to believe in. And so their unrighteousness <laughs> was added unto them as they sought their own kingdom and their own pleasure. They wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years and a whole generation died because of it. And so we can see there that um, unbelief is, uh, really is what leads to death. It, it leads us to death for those of us that don't believe that we are saved by faith uh, in Christ, right? If we don't believe that, it leads to death. Um, Even inside of Christianity, once we come to faith in Christ, we all struggle a little bit with unbelief. Unbelief kind of travels through our minds every once in a while, maybe when times go hard or when there's a little bit of doubt. It's why we see in Scripture where the the gentleman says, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief, he asked Jesus, right? And so we all struggle a little bit with it, but if you're really going to struggle a lot, if you don't believe that Jesus was God, that he died for your sins, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, you're really going to struggle in eternity if we don't come to faith in the finished work of Christ. But in this case, they failed to believe the promises of God and they fell victim to that in the desert. And um, today... In Joshua chapter 5, if you remember last week, we just crossed over the Jordan, right? And, uh, and after crossing the Jordan, uh, we pick up the story today. Now, so far, if you go back into the beginning parts of Joshua, God meets with Josh and he says, look, 
He says, I've given you this land as a promise, and every place that you put the sole of your feet, I'm going to give to you. You're going to have great success. And then he has a clarifier. If you are careful to obey all that I commanded you. In other words, obedience and belief. Right? We, we obey God because we believe in what he's saying and asking for us to do is good. We believe that. And so Joshua and the Israelites are given this opportunity to believe whether or not God is going to be there. And they camp out on the other side of the Jordan when the Jordan is flooded. We talked about that in the springtime. And they waited. They were asked to wait. And they did. When they went across, they were asked for two and a half tribes to stay behind on the land they've already been given, and they did, but God also asked the men, the 40,000 warriors from those two and a half tribes to cross over with the rest of the Israelites, and they did, they obeyed. And then they walked across, they were, the, the priests were asked to carry the ark into the midst of the Jordan, they obeyed, right? And so we see the obedience, right? in the promises of God, in the, in the exercising faith. And so they come across, right? God is faithful to bring them where he promised. So they come across and they're on the other side of the Jordan. Now God is going to ask them again to carry out an act of obedience. And it's, uh, it's, it's it, you know, it's pretty rough on some of the guys, all right? So let's see, let's see what the scripture has to say. And I am just going to read the whole chapter, and then we're going to come back. So we'll be up on the screen, bear with me, and we'll come back and look at it in a little more detail. As soon as all of the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gilboth Herloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All of the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all of the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all of the people who came out of had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt has, had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children who he raised up in their place that Joshua was circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled the approach of Egypt from you. I've rolled away the reproach. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. There was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And many of you can see some similarities there about how when, when Moses was presented, uh, you know, the presence of God in a burning bush, 
and the same exchange happened. But let's go back to the beginning of Joshua chapter 5. And what we, what we see here is that word had gotten out, and Rahab knew that, uh, that the Israelites were coming and that they had taken out these two kings on the other side of the Jordan, and they were going to be unstoppable. And so we can see the Amorites on this side of the Jordan had no spirit left in them. Their hearts had melted, and uh, the kings who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan because the people had crossed over and their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. And so there was no reason to fight when they came on the other side of the Jordan, even though that was the land of the Canaanites, right? Because the spirit had just been quenched inside the people, knowing that these people are carrying this influence of Yahweh, and we're in trouble, all right? And so um, then it goes right into this. So at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. But we see as we read through there, what has happened is all of the males of a whole entire generation that left Egypt in the Exodus, right, had been circumcised, but they all died in the wilderness. Their children, however, were not circumcised. And so he's asking them to circumcise everyone, uh, all males, once they get on the other side of the Jordan. Where does circumcision come from? Glad you asked. Turn to Genesis chapter 17. All right. Genesis chapter 17. This is when the circumcision or the covenant was issued um, to Abraham. He says, this is my covenant, Genesis 17, 10, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. So we see here, that this is God's way of establishing or cutting, all right, a covenant between God and man. If you look through the covenants found in Scripture, every covenant that God makes is always ratified, interestingly enough, in blood. And so he asks the males, he asks the, the parents of the males to make sure their babies are circumcised at eight years old as a sign of the promise of the covenant between God and man. All right, this is where it was established. Now, I love, I don't really love it, but every now and then I love to read about scientific data and biology and stuff like that. Well, how many of you know that when babies are born, I'm not sure if they do today, but I remember when I was born, I remember when my children was born, they would give them a, a, an injection of vitamin K. Anybody, they still do that today? Yeah, you know what vitamin K does? It helps to coagulate the blood of the baby. All right, now, why do they give that early on? Because they don't want the baby to bleed. And if the baby bleeds, there's a chance the baby could die, right? So they give that at birth. Usually on the third day, if the parents decide to circumcise their child, they're circumcised. Why on the third day? Because they've proven that on the third day, the baby develops 30%, the male baby develops 30% of its own thrombrosin as one aspect of the blood of the other is vitamin K, all right? on the third day. But guess what happens on the eighth day of the baby? Their vitamin K goes up to 110%, right? How did God know that? Circumcise the babies on the eighth day, all right? Just a little extra for you this morning. God is so, I mean, he's our creator. So he knew when it would be best for them to be circumcised. Now, other nations, other nations besides the Jews, circumcised, but they, they would actually call it a circumspect. And they would basically cut the foreskin a little bit for whatever reason, we don't know. But circumcised means to take and draw a circle. It actually means, if you really break it down, it means to set yourself apart, to set your flesh apart for God. And there's a, so much that goes into it, and you could read about it in the New Testament, which we're not going to have time to go into this morning, right? About how it transitions, and in, even in the Old Testament, it says one thing is to be circumcised, but this covenant relationship also will be a covenant that will circumcise your heart, that will take your heart and turn it towards me, your heart that is for you, you, yourself, and I, me, myself, and I, and it will turn it towards me and others. Circumcise your heart, right? And this is God's work. And you can see it in Scripture in the New Testament. It says that we are circumcised now by not any work of the hands. This is a mystery. This is a spiritual circumcision that 
that we receive, right, in Christ. We're no longer required, you know, if you really want to look at it, no longer required on this side of the New Testament for children to be circumcised. It's not part of the covenant because the covenant now is ratified in the blood of Christ, right? And now we have this relationship with him and we're going to see this new covenant, right, being cut at the Lord's Supper when we get there for communion. You, hear, you with me so far? All right, let's get beyond that. All right, so I want to read to you the whole account, the, the half of the account of the very first Passover, all right? We talk about Passover a lot, uh, and, and I want to read to you the account. The first Passover ever, right, happened in Egypt, right, the night that the death angel passed over the firstborn of the children of Israel that were held captive in Egypt, all right? And we know that what was going to happen that night was God was going to send his final plague to Pharaoh and the firstborn of all children, their lives would be taken that night unless the blood of the lamb would be on the doorposts of those Israelites and the death angel would pass over. So that very first Passover happened and here's the account found in Exodus chapter 12. All right. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this is going to be lengthy, so bear with me. This month shall be for you the beginning of months, all right? The Jews started the whole calendar right here, right? And it's always a lunar calendar, and this is going to be the first month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. And you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord." The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Look at this. Remember last week we talked about these memorial stones, right? Look at what he says about Passover. This day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it As a feast, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. What is leaven? It's yeast, right? It's what makes the bread rise. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly, and no work shall be done on those days, but... What everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, 
No leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a soldier or native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. You still with me? No one asleep yet? Are you bored yet? <laughs> Hang in there. Then Moses called all the Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourself according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lentil of the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, which is right where we're going, right? When you come to the land where the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Oh my gosh, I I'm not very patient. I, I wanna get to the very end of the message right now. Just remember what he says, like, uh, <laughs> when your children say, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Oh my goodness gracious. For he passed over the houses of the people in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses and the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. All right, now that's the first Passover. There's a little something else as we read through this chapter in Exodus chapter 12 that we're gonna to skip to. It's in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. There's more instructions all the way through Exodus chapter 12. Go back home and read the whole thing. But when you get to verse 48, did I give you that, Steve? Exodus 12, 48. When you get to 48, you see this. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all of his males be circumcised. Then he may come near it and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Wow, interesting. All right, now, go to Numbers chapter 9, all right? <laughs> go to Numbers chapter 9, verse 1. This is exactly a year after the first Passover. And now they're in the Sinai desert, right? So they are now asked, right? to celebrate as a memorial this Passover when they fled Egypt, when they were released from Egypt. Numbers chapter nine, verse one. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt saying, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it as its appointed time, according to all its statutes and all its rules, you shall keep it. And so they did. The first year after they come out of Egypt, they kept the Passover. Now, nowhere between that scripture and the one we read in Joshua chapter 5, do they ever do the Passover again. For 40 years, 38 years, if you go 38 years, you don't see any account of it. So the only thing we could take away and say, well, uh, why? What happened? Well, remember, the whole period of time is a period of consequences for their unbelief. They also weren't circumcised during that time. The covenant promise of God wasn't executed or ratified during that whole time. And then a whole generation fell. A whole generation. Interesting. And then we hit Joshua chapter 5, 38 years later. And they're there, guess when? In the month of Nisan, the first month. Springtime. Jordan is flooded. Coincidence? I don't think so. Right? We said the other week ago, why did God bring him there to that place when it was flooded? So he could execute his power? Yes. 
but also because it was the time of the month right before the Passover. Now, God is going to ask them to celebrate this Passover. He's going to ask them to get circumcised before they celebrate the Passover. Now you know why. But why does he really want to do it? Because he's asking them to be obedient to his word. His word commands it. This is a whole new... How many of you came from a lineage where there was very little to no faith? And now all of a sudden you walked into this promise of God and a whole new generation has discovered the promises of God. And there's a new generation and, and the disappointment is gone and, and the old is past and new has come and you can't wait to tell your parents or your children. How many of you lived a life like that? I did, right? On one half of my, of my family, it was a family of faith. On the other side of the family, it, it didn't, didn't have much faith. And then all of a sudden, it, faith came to our household and then it started to spread. There was a new generation. It was a new time. But God still asks for the same thing in either generation. Can you believe me? Can you be faithful? Can you do what I've asked you? Can you do what I commanded? And if you do, then these promises that I've given you will be fulfilled, like taking this land. But the first thing he does is he tests them to see if they're in the faith. And he says, all right, men, it's time to be circumcised. And then it says that they waited there until they were healed, and then they celebrated this Passover, this meal. Also, if you noticed what we read there, the manna stopped falling from heaven. The manna was what was given to them as food in the desert. It came from heaven. But now that God has promised them this land flowing with milk and honey, the manna stops the day they take Passover from the land. Coincidence? I don't think so, right? And so we see now something even more extraordinary, right, is about to happen. So after the circumcision and after they celebrate um, Passover, going back in the first couple of chapters, right, in, in chapter 3, I think it was, where we are introduced to Rahab and when the spies went over into the land to spy out the land and they see the big walls and the fortified city, Joshua already knew that. He knows that this is going to take a miraculous conquest in order to overcome these fortified cities and all the inhabitants of this land. And so he's been told that, listen, I'm going to give you this victory, right? Just trust me. Well, then God does something amazing. He stands before Joshua and he speaks to him in what some people call a theophany or Christophany. The Bible doesn't call it that. The Bible just simply says that Joshua, in chapter um, 5, verse 13, after the Passover was celebrated, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him. Now listen, this is a courageous warrior. <laughs> Joshua has already fought and won some battles on the other side of the Jordan. I brought my infamous sword that was given to me. It's a whole other story, but trust me, I'm not going to hurt anybody. But the, the edges have been dulled because the people that bought it for me knew who they were giving it to, I suppose. But. <laughs> so Joshua's a warrior. He doesn't know this person, and he's coming out and He's just been, you know, doing everything the Lord has said, right? And you know, you know a man of war, a man of valor, right? Has courage, right? But now all of a sudden he sees this unknown man standing like this. Now what, what would you do? I would draw mine, you know, I'd get something, right? But he's standing there and he's got his attention. And then he says, are you for us? Are you for us? Or are you for our adversaries? Great question. He doesn't know, but he's approaching him anyway. That takes courage. That takes faith. So there's an execution of faith right there in Josh, right? I'm going to go up to you, right? I'm not going to let fear keep me back. I'm going to go up to you. I'm going to ask you who you are, right? And then he says, he says to him, uh, no. <laughs> he doesn't say 
yeah, I'm with you, or no, I'm not with them. He says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. All right, now, listen, I, I don't know if we can really mind the depths of that statement, but God in this form is saying, no, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now, Josh does something immediately, if you will. He bows down and he worships. Now, we know in Scripture, when any time an angel was bowed down to, they said, no, 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 you don't, you don't worship me. So, obviously, this hologram or this person with a sword is standing there, allows him to get on his knees and bow down, right? And then proclaim something very fascinating. He says, Josh, Joshua says, tell me what I must do. Speak to me, your servant. Wow. He is completely submissive in that moment. This warrior is going to lead the whole tribe of Israel. All of a sudden, if it was going to go to his head or it was going to put pressure on him, he was defeated by the grace of God in that moment. Listen, listen, Josh, I, I, am, I am the general of God's army, not your army, of God's army. I'm the captain of God's army. That's who you're looking at right now. And he bows down and he says, okay, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And you know what he says? Take your shoes off because it's holy. So he's introduced to the holiness of God, the reverence of God, right? What would have that holiness or that reverence of God, right, or the sword look like with no faith? What would the holiness of God or the reverence of God look like if they not had been obedient in that moment? Think about that. Had they not done everything that he commanded? And so suddenly now, he's been introduced, right, by the grace of God, by the holiness of God, by the power of God, and given, if, if you, if you can, can get this just in just for a moment, that God is gonna go before him just like he said he was. And he will find out next week, or you can read ahead in Joshua chapter six, just how powerful this commander of the Lord's army is, which will now be invisible the rest of the conquest of Canaan. But he shows up there. He shows up right there. And I, 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 I've been thinking about that a lot. What is my takeaway with that, right? Well, it's, it's got to be in context of the rest of the story, right? Or the pr preceding storyline of obedience. It's also got to be this, is that, listen, if, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, then I am doing his will, right? And I can rest assured that his presence is with me and that he goes before me. And I could rest assured that if he's got a promise, that he's going to keep the promise, but let's back it up a little bit more. Go back to the circumcision. What did he say? What did God say to his people? He said this. God said to his people, he said, today, after the circumcision, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. What does reproach mean? My disappointment. This is for us. This is for me. You know, when you were in Egypt, I, I, I know you were in slavery, and then I freed you from slavery, and then, and then you came out, and then, and then you, 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 know, you, just, you, you couldn't quite trust me, you couldn't quite believe me, yet. even though I was the fire at night to warm you, and at, by, by night to, to give you light, and I fed you during the day, and I protected you, I, I still loved you, but you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't believe. And so the judgment was death. And so there is some people in this crowd of witnesses that were little bitties at that time. And he said, listen, I'm no longer disappointed in you. I have rolled back the reproach. Gilgal means to be rolled back. Guess what? It's right where the stones were placed. It's right where they were to remember. It's right where they held the first Passover in the promised land. And guess what? As we go through the book of Joshua, it would be their beachhead. It would be their place that they would retreat to all the time to recoup and to regather. And every time they would come back, they would remember that God is not disappointed in us. He's no longer holding this against us. In other words, the shame that could have crept in and paralyzed them, right? They were told has been rolled away. It's been rolled away. 
How many of us, the whole men's camp is predicated on that scripture about looking back and not letting it define who you are. You can be defined when you look back and see where God met you at the Jordan, where God met you. But you're to look back there to where he met you. You're not to look back there where you disappointed him. Because on this side, right, of this side of the new covenant, our sins are forgiven. They're moved as far as the east is from the west. So many people are debilitated with shame because of past sins. I know people, they can't move, they can't go beyond. Either shame that they have caused or shame that they have felt as someone has sinned against them. And God is saying, listen, I've rolled that back. I'm no longer disappointed. What, he's, what, he, is, what, what he is leading into, right, is the Israelites' identity in the promise, I'm for you. Just do everything I ask you to do. And so far, they're right on, they're right on. They're just, they're just doing it. Ask yourself, when I look back, do I see those stones? Do I see where God was victorious over my sin? Or when I look back, am I wallowed in shame? Am I heaped up like a little heap back there? Ask yourself that question. God did not want Israel to be that way. He did not want them to look back and feel the shame. There is some really good guilt. It's okay to feel shame after you're guilty, right? And that's been said, and it's kind of it's true, right? That guilt comes for what you did. And it's good guilt. We should feel guilty when we sin against God or when we sin against other people. And we, feel, we should feel ashamed at times for what we've done. But with this side of the covenant, with the blood of the lamb, the true Passover lamb having canceled out the debt or the requirement that was against us, right? Then we should believe that and not wander in the wilderness of unbelief, whether it's been forgiven or not. Otherwise, we're going to die in that shame. So they say that shame is a projection if you stay there long enough of who you are instead of what you've done. And that's what can be really crippling. That can be very depressing. Talk to some people who were stuck in a place of depression and, and, and sometimes the root goes back to feeling horrible about something that they've done that they've never been able to depart from. And God's telling the people of Israel, listen, you had 40 years of a whole, a whole generation back there that suffered because of unbelief. But today is a new day. Today, I'm rolling that back. And he could do that for you. There's nothing more powerful than to be freed from sin or freed from shame. There's nothing. Yesterday was my mother's uh, one-year home going. And I, Terry asked me yesterday, I love my wife so much. She's so <clears throat> unselfish. She said, Bob, what, what's your best memory of your mom? Came out like that when she told me all of her secrets that she was ashamed of. That's my favorite day with my mom. She was 70 and I was 50. I don't have time to go into it. But she was packing some really heavy stuff. And she just brought it into the light. And their whole countenance on her face changed. And I saw the glory of the Lord beset my, my mother's face and she cried for the first time. She hugged me for the first time. I'm 50, she's 70. We're talking about major freedom. God rolled, rolled the disappointment away that she had carried. God didn't. God never carried that. Take a look at this passage of scripture in Isaiah 61. I, I, I never really 
fasten this scripture to where we're at, but, but I'm going to this morning, okay? Isaiah 61, verse 7. This is where we get all the beautiful, you know, language or poetry that, I, that God gave Isaiah about, I'll give you beauty for ashes, right? A beautiful headdress in place of mourning. But also found in there is this passage, Isaiah 61, 7, instead of your shame, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land that they shall possess a double portion and they shall have everlasting joy. Take a look at this scripture found in Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, this faith that we proclaim, this faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified or made right, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Oh my gosh. If you are someone that walks in here that, that is having trouble with this thing called forgiveness of sin, look at God's heart. He doesn't want you to wallow in shame. If you believe in him and you are justified and you confess with your mouth and you're saved, right? And, 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 and you're not to be put to shame by anyone or yourself. I'm hoping there's someone here this morning that gets freedom from that place. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. He doesn't say, thanks for coming to me, now go in the corner and I want you to remember all the bad stuff you did. No, he bestows his riches on you. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So shame speaks to who you are, but guilt speaks to what you've done. And Jesus says, I've got a pardon for that. His name is Jesus, all right? What time is it? We gotta roll, we gotta roll. No pun intended. All right, before we do, I wanna just share this with you, what Spurgeon says as he took a look at why, how the Israelites waited, right, before they went to battle, right, which we're gonna go next week. I probably could have wet, read it this week, but while it's still fresh in your mind, look at what he puts here so eloquently about the waiting, right? The children of Israel may be likened to yonder gallant vessel, in other words, a big ship, prepared for a long voyage. All the cargo is on board that is needed, and all the stores are there, and every man is in his place. In all the respects, the good ship is fully equipped. But why does she linger? Why do not the sailors weigh the anchor? If you ask the man at the helm, he will tell you, we are waiting for the captain. A good and sufficient reason indeed, for till the captain has come on board, it is idle for the vessel to be put out to sea. So here Israel had been circumcised and the blessed feast of the fat Paschal Lamb had been celebrated, but still they must not go to the conflict until the captain himself had arrived. And here to Joshua's joy, the angel of the presence of the Most High appeared to claim the presidency of the war and lead forth the host of God to certain victory. Are you certain? Are you certain that he came and that he saved and he has victory over your sin? Are you certain? Back up a few months before my mom came to me, she told me that she could forgive anybody. She never held anything against anybody, kinda, sorta, <laughs> kinda, sorta. But she held everything against herself. 
And she said, I, I just can't forgive myself. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm like plowing scripture, plowing scripture. I wanted to help my mom. And the first thing I discovered was that you can't forgive yourself. Nowhere in scripture it asks you to forgive yourself. You are incapable of forgiving yourself. I gave my mom a little book. And inside it explained all of that. No, Linda, you, 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 you're incapable of that. You must believe that God has done that. You're capable of forgiving others as he's forgiven you. But you're not capable of forgiving yourself of sin. It must be something that you received as a gift of his perfect sacrifice of this lamb that was prepared four days before the Lord's table. Turn to Luke 22 and we'll finish here. By the way, uh, the Passover uh, this year is April the 22nd. It's always a lunar calendar and it changes every year. It's later this year. We'll be celebrating Easter early. Luke 22, 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread. Now this is when uh, Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed. He knew that they were going to come after him. He knew that his day was coming. He knew everything that was happening. And so he had to be secretive, but he had to keep the Passover because the Father commands it. Then came the day of unleavened bread, which means the same thing as Passover, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed on twilight on the 14th of Nisan. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them miraculously, he said, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and they found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. If the ushers would start to begin to pass communion, if the worship team would come up. When the hour came, he reclined at that table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, listen, I, I, I want to, I know, you, you know, we got to be careful when we do things like this, but I love imagining if I was there. And Jesus says this, I've earnestly desired to have this meal with you. The Passover. Been celebrated for Years and years and years and years. And I've earnestly desired to celebrate this Memorial Day or this Passover with you. Before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the first cup, which is not the second cup, but he took this first cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Hold the, hold the uh, bread just for a moment, you guys. I'm sorry, I should have told you to do that. Hold, the, hold it up uh, for just a second, you guys, just one second. Today we shift. Today we make a shift from the two cups that we came up with, uh, you know, in 2020 to real matzo bread out of a common plate. What is matzo bread? This is real Jewish Passover matzo bread, unleavened, no yeast. Baked, no rice. They didn't say this, but we can say this on this side of the Passover that Jesus had, that this, is, this bread was 
always headed in this direction. If I hold it up, I could see light between every little hole or piercing. I could see bruises and stripes. Imagine Jesus holding this up and he says, he broke it, he gave thanks. He broke it. This is my body that will be broken for you. When you receive communion today, it'll be this bread. Jewish unleavened matzah bread broken into little pieces. We haven't had it since 2020 and maybe God wanted us to do it today for a reason. As we have passed over the Jordan, we get to celebrate with our ancestors Passover. So go ahead and pass that around, no pun intended. For I will tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, a memorial. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's the same blood from the Lamb of God that will be poured out over our hearts for remission of sin, so the judgment, the judgment will pass over us. We pass into eternity because of the blood of an eternal covenant. The blood of the Lamb is sitting at this table after hundreds of years. He couldn't quite see it then, but we know later that he sees it. And now, instead of setting up stones, instead of setting behind a Passover meal, a Seder, instead of manna falling from heaven and now we're eating off the land, now manna exists no more. The manna, the bread of life is here. captain of the Lord's army, the one who was slain before the foundations of the world and one who has now reconciled us back to the Father and the adversary, the devil that would like to keep us wallowed in shame has been defeated, has been defeated at the cross. And the blood that he's poured out is for the remission of sin, he says. And now all that he asks us to do is as often as we take this, remember him, remember him and believe. Believe in him, receive in him victory over sin, receive in him the Passover, receive in him no shame. Let's eat and drink together.